All right, guys, welcome back to the channel and another episode in the TMJ show where I help students just like you on their medical journey and hopefully you get some advice as well. Today, we are talking to Christy on all about how to manage some of the biggest struggles as a brand new medical student, including how to study for really hard classes like anatomy, histology, physiology, things that you may be struggling with as well. So let's get into it. Christy, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. So what can we help you with? Um, so I have some questions about how to like study topics, for example, like physiology or more conceptual topics um, where you have to learn concepts rather than just kind of memorizing facts. So that was my first question. Sure, absolutely. So I'm assuming you're a first year since you're asking those questions, is that right? Yes. Awesome. Um, have you tried any resources or ways to study for physiology or those kinds of conceptual topics before? I have, I use BRS, um, but for me, I think I'm a more visual learner. So I kind of have to put them together in like a big diagram, for instance, sure. to kind of try to learn how it works together. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so diagrams are, are personally great options. I think for things like uh, physiology that are, like I agree with you, are definitely conceptual based and requires like a step-by-step -step understanding. Um, the approach I usually take is, you know, especially being a visual learner, is let's say, let's say you know what your physiology topic for tomorrow in class is going to be. Um, I would personally go watch like a YouTube video or find a resource that you really enjoy. But video really works well for visual learners to understand essentially the conceptual map. So like for step one, to step four of how somebody would explain it to you. Um, and then you can, you know, go through a resource like BRS or if the video did a great job, then try to create that conceptual map from memory um, on a piece of paper that you can ideally keep. So that's kind of my definition of the brain dump. So if you're learning, let's say a great example is like the physiology of how the heart works and how it pumps and the pacemakers and the heart um, and the way the, you know, the different um, electrolytes kind of move back and forth to create that. Um, it's really confusing the first time you read it. Um, so if you had a high, real, high yield resource, a visual resource for you in this case, like a video that you can watch and say, okay, like this is the conceptual idea of what I'm supposed to understand. Um, try to recreate it yourself on a piece of paper. And then ideally, ideally you would mark where you're not able to get from point A to point two to point, you know, C all the way to the, the, the end where you can create that lecture again from memory and ideally create that conceptual map. Then you can go back to the resource that you're using. So whether it be BRS or watch that video again, um, but that would be my initial approach about a study. So if I knew my lecture was tomorrow is about pacemaker function of the heart, I would watch that YouTube video of things like osmosis does a great job. There's also other resources that I'll link down below or send to you. Um, to be able to understand that small bit of physiology. Um, but you know, some people really enjoy just reading the text, but for you, watch the video, um, try to create that initial framework yourself on a piece of paper. And now when you're going into lecture, you kind of know what the high yield information is going to be. So you kind of have that conceptual map in your head instead of all the facts given to you at one time, you have the conceptual map instead. So you can pay attention for that in lecture um, and try to make the, the connections a little bit stronger based off the examples your professor gives or the images that they put on their slides. And then you go home and you try to repeat this process again. You try to create that blank piece of paper and conceptual map where you write things out. And now you have a visual representation of everything you understand. How does that sound? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what I'm gathering is if I watch the video, then I get sort of the big picture of what's going on exactly. and you understand the steps that it takes to get from point A to point B or step one to step five. Yeah. And then I can see where I'm getting confused as far as getting from step to step. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Because often when we're reading even great resources like BRS, you know, they don't necessarily connect the dots. They just move the dots, right? So they show you all the mm -hmm. dots that are there. Um, and so you can definitely end up reading a chapter and you're like, I think I understand this. And then by the time the test comes around, the professor explains, you're like, wait, there's something missing. I just don't know what. Um, so instead, if you start with a resource that can really just package it for you and saying, man, if, if I could download this, it'd be amazing. But obviously you just want to know what the finished product looks like. Um, the same mm -hmm. way that when, when you go to like Ikea or something, you know what the furniture looks like. Um, so now you have an idea of where things will go. And then you look at their confusing instructions, like it's like reading a, BR, a BRS or high yield textbook. Mm -hmm. um, it still doesn't always make sense of how things to go together but because you have that visual representation of what things should look like at the very end you can start re-asking yourself questions on like how to configure the information. Or if you need to watch something else, um, 
to be able to connect those dots. So start with that big picture final product, use that resource that you want to, to understand it, and then have your own conceptual map that you're adding and creating. Cause ideally if you can create a nice like blank piece or piece of paper of like how the heart pacemaker cells work, then you can keep that paper there, have like a folder. And then by the time you're getting closer to your exam, you just have to refer to that because that's, you know, that's Christie's version of how the pacemaker works. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll definitely try that um, in the next block because we kind of already got past that section in this block. Sure. Um, so for um, another question I have is, although I do use Pathoma um, to help with, for example, like pathology and histology, mm -hmm. um, our professors do go into a lot more detail and we are responsible for being able to analyze like a lot more images than are in Pathoma. Um, so I was wondering about like the best approach for that, um, especially normal histology, which is not really covered in Pathoma as much because um, we have like hundreds of slides sometimes. Gotcha. But does your, does your slides come with a bunch of examples that are similar to what shows up on the final exam? Um, they do. It's just a lot to kind of take in. I think for this one, we had like 150 slides of um, examples from like possible like, structures that we're responsible for being able to recognize. So we have second order questions that we have to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll ask a second order question about a structure that we have to identify on sure. like histology. Mm -hmm. um, so how are you studying for at the moment? Um, so we tend to have like histology quizzes. So we have this program called like slide hosting. So it has all the slides there. Okay. So usually I, I put them into Anki and then I try to like ask myself second order questions so I can kind of get used to doing that. Sure. So that forces me to identify what the structure is and then answer a question. So if I'm not identifying the structure correctly, then I won't be able to answer the second order question, right? Okay, um, totally makes sense. Um, are you, so what's the difficulty with currently using Anki? Cause that would be a great approach. So what's the friction mm -hmm. that you're experiencing? I think just the volume of it, there's so many slides and they can also look really different from slide to slide. At least sure. to me, they do. Cause histology is difficult for me. Yeah. Um, so one thing I would do is, so just to clarify, um, it seems like some of your questions are second order, but some of your questions are simply like, what am I looking at? Is that, is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sounds good. So, you know, ideally, um, if you're missing the, like the, if you're missing the actual structure and what they are, um, personally, when I'm doing Anki and there's a lot of information, I have to ask myself how I can get through that Anki slide um, in the first pass to be able to get that first bit of knowledge. So ideally, for example, if you have 150 flashcards for all of the things on the slide, then the first focus should be not being able to get in the second order of things. Sometimes like subconsciously, you'll be able to say, oh, I already know what this is. Let me just see if I can quiz myself on what that is. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're going to try to do first and second order, everything on 150 slides with multiple lectures, you're going to get behind. So the first step is, can you identify everything, right? So um, the, the way I would personally do it is if I had 150 Anki cards I needed to do, because it's simply, do I know it or not? Not can I like quickly like figure it out? Um, I would use a timer, use um, a specific timer on your phone, you know, mentally and saying, I have five to 10 seconds to quickly look at the slide and tell you what it is or what it's pointing to. Now that may seem overwhelming, but the good part of it is if you can't do it in five to 10 seconds, then it's not this, the highest uh, material in terms of strength for you. It's something that you kind of know you need to spend more time on, maybe take a guess on. Um, and the beauty of Anki is you can just say, show it to me again. But your first focus is, can I identify all these structures on 150 and just rapidly make myself do it? Five seconds, 10 seconds, 15, the time doesn't really matter. Um, just pick something that's quick enough for you so that way you're not spending excessive amount of time on each flashcard. Now, as you start to go through it, you know, you're going to start to see those flashcards that are structures that you just don't really click and stick home. Um, but over time, it's going to with like, you know, one or two repetitions of Anki. Now, in terms of second order questions, which you still want to prepare for, ideally what you can start do, to do is, let's say you are now finally getting the structures down because you've gone through a few repetitions. 
um, but you don't really know how to answer that second order part of it, I would create a list of what that structure is that you really don't know how to relay into a second order question. So if it's like a specific type of cell type, like, you know, columnar epitheliums, I don't personally don't always remember my, my histology, so bear with me. But if there is something that you remember from histology that is not clicking home, I would create like a list on a Word doc, a Google doc, um, an Excel sheet of those structures that are giving you trouble either identifying um, or answering those second or, uh, order questions. And then have a session in your week where now you can go to Google, you can go to YouTube less so, but Google or uh, BRS histology is also a text if you enjoy how the way BRS works and try to answer and knock out those topics um, over time. So if you're struggling identifying the difference between a columnar epithelium, just Google the different examples that Google will give you to be able to say, okay, these are the similarities I'm starting to notice between the slides I'm getting, possibly things that may show up on the test and here are examples from Google. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think just familiarity is key and mm -hmm. seeing similarities is key. Absolutely. So to avoid getting overwhelmed, you know, your first like idea, just like you said, you have to be able to identify it before you can get to a second order question. So make that your focus the first time without making it stressful. Saying, you know, because it's simply, can you identify it or not? Do it as fast as possible. Things that you can do, quickly press that, show it to again in like three days, four days, and things that you can show it to me in a minute. And now as you go through that pass, if it's 150 you know, slides um, and you're doing them within a few seconds, ideally it won't take a very long time to be able to answer those. And then the second time you do that pass, now you can say, okay, these are the structures I struggled with. Um, so let me identify these first, that's my main focus. And these are the structures I know. So let me start doing that second order thinking. And as you're doing this, create that list of topics or structures that you struggle with, as well as structures that you're okay with, but don't understand that second order level of thinking. Like, what is their function? How do they work? What would happen if, you know, it was displaced, et cetera? Okay. I think that's helpful. All right, guys, hopefully you guys are enjoying this conversation so far with Christy. If you are and you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit that like button down below. One, it helps support the video, but two, it may also get the video in front of somebody who really needs to hear it. Another thing I struggle with, I'll do, although I do fairly well on the practicals for Anatomy Lab, for me, it takes a lot, a lot of time for me to get to the point where I feel like I have sufficient understanding. Sure. So I spend like hours and hours and hours in the lab, <laughs> which Ideally is great, but then I, I sometimes have to sacrifice other things that I have to do. And so I wouldn't, don't want to have to do that. Um, so I have a hard time kind of transferring like the relationships that I learn like in lecture to lab, especially because we learn all of our anatomy in lecture the whole first week, but our block is a lot longer than that, right? And so right. it's hard for me to like recall things from the first week and connect them back to the anatomy lab and also connecting the diagram to the cadaver itself and then from cadaver to cadaver and it just takes me hours and hours of practice um and i just want to be more efficient about doing that just kind of connecting all of that together sure no that's a that's a great question um i will say anatomy is one of those things that will take hours um so you may not be completely uh distant from the right approach um though what i will say is that um when you're going into anatomy lab, especially with a weird structure where week one is like all the information. And then the latter weeks um, are like the, you know, going into lab and like actually figuring things out is I would split your understanding or the, the different, you know, uh, areas of the body. So let's say you're doing the arm. So eventually you'll start with the muscle, you'll do the brachial plexus at some point, you may do the neck at the same time. So you kind of have like these bits of how the lectures are organized. So uh, what I would do is when I went into Anki, or when I was, excuse me, when I want to go into to, to actual cadaver lab, um, I would have some mental model of what I thought that that would look like. And then I would simply compare and contrast when I would get into cadaver or like into the actual cadaver of saying, you know, this is right. This is like, looks right. Here is the internal jugular, here's the external jugular, but I thought this nerve would be here. So mentally I need to address that. Um, and so you just focus on one, kind of aspect of the body that you'll be learning it and focus on that that mental model and that diagram um, and over time what you'll be able to do is you know ideally as you're going through anatomy you can just create a list thankfully i had this list when i was going into 
um, for my class, but all the structures that you need to know. And it won't take you a lot of effort to create those lists of all the structures you need to be able to identify. Um, but ideally you can then gr group them. So you can identify, create a list of all the structures you need to know for anatomy. And then you can group them like here's an upper neck uh, anatomy structures that I need to know. Here's a lower neck, here is the brachial plexus structures, et cetera. And then each time you go in, your idea is go in with the framework of where things should be, look at a cadaver and reconfigure your mental framework. And so recorrect. And then ideally look at another cadaver um, where you can say, okay, here is how things lay out. I feel like I understand this better and move from structure to structure. So then it's effective. Again, it's not always the most time saving, but the idea is when you go into lab, you should be able to come out saying, I understand how the upper neck anatomy works. And not only can I do it on one cadaver, I can do it on the second one. Um, and then you mm -hmm. keep every time you go into the next uh, session, it should be, let's focus on the next part. So go on with the mental model, whether it's watching a video on YouTube, using your diagrams from your lecture, saying these are how things would look like if the cadaver was right in front of me. Go in, see the cadaver and recorrect. Look at one more um, and then do that self-correction. And ideally, as you do that with more repetition, you'll have a mental model, not just that's stuck in your head, but something that applies to multiple different forms of anatomy in two different cadavers or more. Okay, I think that makes sense. I think with the actual identification itself, I think I do fine. I think my main struggle is like the lecture style questions is what I think I have most trouble with. Sure. Um, but I think those also require a good understanding of not only how the structures are positioned relative to each other, but also like relationships to other things that we learned in class and also clinical correlates. Right. So I think that just comes with a lot of practice is what yeah. I'm just gathering at. Yeah, it's, it's one of those classes that is frustrating, but the, the way I personally would structure is my first thing is to have like a, a picture of what things would look like. And so usually I would do this before dissection for you. It's that first week, go into lab and say, oh, you know, crap, like this is not how it looks like. Let me like readdress where I thought things would be and then fix my issues um, and then ideally identify it on another structure either at that time or another session um, and then using things like Anki to be able to like use the image inclusions to be able to get those mental models a little bit better refined uh, and those clinical correlates I loved using questions from like UWorld or USMLE RX because they would ask questions like oh if you lost this nerve or if you got injured here what would be the symptoms you would be seeing or if somebody came in with like numbness on these fingers uh, what would that be um, so ideally then you have a good group of like, oh, it's the ulnar nerve, which goes here, which I also remember from my clinical correlates, like they love to ask a question about where it is in the elbow. And that again is repetition, but it's like a step-by-step -step repetition. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm going to try to make sure I have a good understanding when I'm in lab and then build on that information Absolutely. as I go. Yeah, I feel like some, a, lot of, a lot of times the struggle is you go and see a cadaver and you're just hoping things stick but cadavers are not pretty, you know, you may cause the damage yourself. So if you come in with a mental model and then correct, it's much easier versus like saying, I hope this sticks. So maybe that initial approach may just be going in with resources. Anatomy Zone 3D is great. It's YouTube videos that can give you pictures in your mind. And then you can walk in yeah. and say, oh, it looks like that. Great. It doesn't look like that. Let me fix that. So how many times do you recommend, I guess, reviewing a lecture and over what period of time? I think that's something that I'm still trying to figure out like i have a spreadsheet where i try to review each lecture at least four times um within a block and so i mark down like what date i reviewed it at and like my comfort level with it so is it is it easy medium or hard Perfect. um did i watch the lecture did i do cards for that lecture like all that information is in there nice um, personally, I think the three to four repetitions is, is a good mix. Um, I would usually do it, the, obviously, the day of lecture. You have a little bit of repetition if you do study anything before the lecture, but you don't have to. Uh, but the day of lecture is repetition one. During that weekend, I would break the first day of the weekend, so Saturday to do uh, Monday to Wednesday's lectures, and then the, the Sunday to do uh, Thursday to Fridays um, with a little bit of kind of preparations for Mondays. That's how I would split it, so that'd be repetition two. And then if you had a four week block, then you know week three would be also let's start reviewing for those things from week one and week two. Um, and like each day I would be doing like two or three lectures in addition to what I was doing for class by just either doing my flashcards again or doing practice questions. That would be repetition three. And then week four, I'm really just going into like, not cram mode, but ideally you've seen everything, you know, a few times now. And now it's more of like, oh, like, let me look at everything really fast and saying, 
oh, here's a topic that's gonna give me trouble on the test for sure. So let me spend time now reviewing this. That's repetition four. Um, so as long as you do it in a structured way that's comfortable, you don't have to go crazy. So three to four is perfect. But yeah, thank you so much for being a part of this interview. Hopefully a lot of people get some help and advice that is applicable to you, but also applicable to their journey. But hopefully you have a good one and we'll talk to you soon. I hope you do too. All right. I guess hopefully you guys enjoy this episode and this interview that we have with Christy. She has a great head on her shoulders. She's going to do great things, but obviously she needed some help here and there. So also let me know in the comment section down below what advice you would have given to her, what questions you guys have as a brand new medical student. And speaking of advice, if you do want more step-by-step -step advice just like this, and you don't want to wait for our next episode, then go ahead and check out some of the resources and programs that we have for you at the MD Journey. You guys can check out the Domination Bundle as well as all of our other programs linked down below. And most importantly, you'll also be able to find all the reviews and feedbacks from past students. So if you guys are interested, go ahead and check it out. Down below but if you did make it this far in the video then go ahead and hit that like button to support the video to support the channel and again ideally get this episode in front of other people who may also need this advice if you're watching this on youtube hit that subscribe down below if you're listening to it on the podcast then go ahead and subscribe and follow and consider leaving an honest review on itunes and if you guys enjoyed this episode then check out this episode on how to use anki like a pro as well as all of our interviews for the doc talk series right here thank you guys so much for joining me on this episode as always i'll see you guys in the next one take care my friends peace